Amen. Good seeing you this morning. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Proverbs 4, uh, the fourth chapter of Proverbs. We're going to be looking here at the first seven verses this morning. When you get into the nuts and bolts of preaching, the type of messages that you hear preached, and it's really like a lot of other things in life. There's, there is the, the, the message that's firefighting. In other words, it's putting out a fire. It's trying to correct something that's a symptom that's really out of control. Uh, and then there's preventive. And so this morning would fall more in the lines of preventive. It's more along the lines of let's be on the right track so that we don't have failures and breakdowns and fires that flare up later uh, in life. And whatever stage of life you're in, it's not too late to set some of these principles in order this morning. And so I am will just tell you from the outset this morning that if you're the kind of person that wants to find something to be offended about, you're going to have plenty to be offended about today. Uh, and so I'm not going to try to be unkind in any way or, uh, or ugly, but in the day and age in which we live, it just really doesn't take much for some uh, to get turned sideways, and I'm going to be dealing really in the message today with the underlying fundamental problems that plague our society uh, and even our churches today. It used to be these things were with outside the church. Now they are fully immersed and interwoven into it and its culture within the church. And so these are things that wear away at the fabric of what God wants us to be uh, and destroy uh, what God's ability to use us effectively in the time in which we live. Proverbs chapter number four, beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also... And said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her wisdom not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. I'm going to speak this morning on this thought very simply, the principal thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word, for our time together. Lord, clear our hearts and our minds. Lord, may Holy Spirit, you examine us and convince us of the truths of these Bible tr principles, Lord, this morning. May we implement them into our daily lives in a way that helps our light to shine in a dark world. That our lives might not just be a life of existence, but that we might be productive and bearing fruit for you in these days on this earth. Lord, help us now, we pray in Jesus' name and amen. <coughs> as we look here this morning, just the, the principal players as uh, David is the father who is instructing his son Solomon. And so when he makes reference there about hearing the instruction of a father and attending to know, uh, he says, for I was my father's son. So Solomon is instructing his children the principles that David instructed him. He talks about being the, the beloved son of his mother. His mother was Bathsheba. Uh, and so when we kind of look at this picture here, you see David, who is the king, who is a man after God's own heart, but certainly is flawed. Uh, you see Bathsheba, who uh, who has certainly uh, paid a high price for sin with David and, uh, and, uh, and moving forward, but is there now by her son's side as he sits on David's throne. And Solomon, the Bible tells us that no, no wiser man was ever born. God gave him a measure of wisdom uh, that only the Lord Jesus Christ exceeded. However, Solomon was also a man who failed to live by the wisdom that he had in his heart. He did not finish the way he began. He, he gave sound doctrine. He gave wonderful advice. And then he failed to follow it. 
And because he failed to follow it, his life ended very differently than it began. His reign as king ended very differently than it began. I can't help but wonder this morning what the history and the future of Israel would have looked like had Solomon stayed true to his own advice here in Proverbs chapter 4. Now, the message this morning is really not about him personally, but he does show in his life what happens when these things that he says not to forsake are forsaken. And we would be foolish to think that if the wisest man on the earth in all of history could fall away or decline from this truth, that we would be exempt from being able to drift away or to fall and decline from this truth. When we look and we understand what's going on here, Solomon is conveying to his son the truths that his father David taught him. He's giving good doctrine. And he says very plainly in verse 2, For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. <clears throat> and so he's giving good teaching, doctrine uh, meaning simply teaching. I'm giving you good, valuable principles on which to base your life and to live your life, to govern and to guide your life. And you may struggle and you may stray and you may fall, but come back to these principles. He says here uh, to retain, in verse 4, my words, keep my commandments and live. And so retain my words. I'm giving you good doctrine, son. Pay attention to it and live it. That's the message this morning. That's the message that Solomon gives to his son. So we talk about this book of Proverbs. And what is a proverb? And a proverb, uh, by definition, is simply a short sentence expressing in a few words a well-known truth. And so it is a sentence sermon, if you will. <clears throat> And so when you look and you see uh, it's taking a broad issue and it's taking it down to a concise statement so that if you are familiar with and have understanding of what it's communicating, that sentence statement sums up for you things that you already know and that, that dwell within you so that you can be reminded and live your life by them. In verse 5, we see a father's command, get wisdom, get understanding. In other words, these are not things that just come to you on their own. It's something that you have to pursue. It's something that you have to have a hunger for. It's something that you have to desire. Proverbs 18, 1 says, through desire, a man having separated himself. You must, the things that we desire, we set ourselves aside to attain. He's saying here to his children, get wisdom, desire wisdom, set yourself, dedicate yourself to the acquisition and the learning of wisdom and get understanding. So let's understand for a moment what these terms mean when we talk about, uh, when we talk about them here so that we understand the context. Number one, wisdom is the right or the correct use of knowledge, the exercise of knowledge. Anybody can acquire knowledge, or almost anybody. Anybody can learn information, but not everyone can take the information that they learn and use it well, to use it properly, to use it profitably. There are a lot of people that could sit and parrot to us great truths and principles from the Word of God, but they've never lived them, and their lives are a mess because they've never lived the things that they know. The truth does you no good until you use it. Right. A tool in the toolbox is just a tool in the toolbox. It really doesn't have any value other than its existence until you need it and use it for what it was intended. When we look and we understand wisdom, wisdom is not just taking and learning information. It is learning to use it properly. Learning to use it effectively and efficiently. Get wisdom, he says. Get understanding. Understanding is the comprehending of the ideas or the sense of another. It is not just comprehending, however, it's also apprehending. Comprehending, apprehending the ideas or the sense of another. Proverbs, or Philippians, rather, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. To acquire or to apprehend the mind of Christ. I don't know, probably five or six times this week, I've thought something's articulated and my wife said, I was just thinking the exact same thing or vice versa. 
We've been together for so long that we think alike. There are a lot of times that we just naturally, at the same moment, the same thoughts pop in our head or we reach the same conclusions. If you live with someone for 32 years and uh, dated four years before that, uh, then, then you, you kind of comprehend and many of you exceed that in years together. So you understand really what I'm talking about. If you're younger, it may be a little bit more difficult for you to understand that. But let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, apprehending and understanding the thoughts, the ideas, the values of another. In other words, his values become my values. His way of thinking becomes my way of thinking. His truths become my truths. My uh, way of perceiving becomes that of God's. But listen, that's the way that God intended the Christian life to be. He didn't intend for us to take his truth to interpret it by the world's uh, by the world's outlook and then try to marry the two together. And by the way, that's what's wrong with the church today. What's, what's wrong and what's causing the fundamental breakdown of churches today is that we have taken God's values and we've taken the world's values and we've tried to blend them together. That doesn't work. There are some things that just don't mix. And so, I mean, we could get into all kinds of illustrations about oil and water and this and that and the other, but we all understand the concept. There are some things that just do not mix together. And he says, apprehend them understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's part of the definition of understanding. Apprehending means to seize or to take control of. Now that can be easy or that can be hard. That can be uh, peaceful or that can be violent. A police officer doesn't violently apprehend someone because they want to. They do so because it has to be done. What's preferable is for the person to just obey the command and surrender or yield themselves to arrest and allow themselves to be taken into custody without a struggle. That's always the best outcome. But whenever someone must be taken in and they won't voluntarily cooperate, then law enforcement must do what has to be done to get it under control. What I'm saying this morning is he says, get wisdom, get understanding. You have to desire it. You have to attain it. You have to go after it. You have to be willing to sacrifice to get it. And if it comes easily, praise the Lord. But if it's a struggle, pay the price. But apprehend it. Get it and get it now. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. It's interesting that he says decline. Because he's not talking about decline in the sense of uh, I, he made an offer and you declined it and said, no, that's not the context here. It's not talking about just abruptly stopping something and changing your value system. Listen, people don't stop being submitted to, surrendered to, and obeying God on a whim overnight. It's a process. People that, uh, there's a reason why the Bible talks about in the New Testament falling away. Because it doesn't happen, uh, you don't just wake up faithfully, you don't faithfully serve God for years, wake up one morning and decide, I'm done with that. There's decline that's been taking place. There's a, a, a decaying that's been taking place. If you noticed this morning when you pulled up, there's a big chunk of the sign missing. And so maybe you noticed that, maybe you didn't, but uh, the name of the church is still up there, but all of the other board, the whole other board that's got service time and website information and all that kind of stuff, it's gone. Why? Because it decayed. It still looked great on the outside, but it was just a piece of plywood that had a wrap around it. A wrap, if you know what I'm talking about, like you'd put on a car. It's just basically uh, a, whatever you want printed on a big piece, of, piece of, of plastic wrapping, and it's encased around that. And somehow, some way, water penetrated that wrap, and it got into that wood until it rotted away slowly over time. And a powerful enough wind came from the right direction and ripped it out. And it crumbled. It just folded over. And so I hate the big hole in the sign out there, but it's indicative and it really wasn't planned to, I didn't go destroy the sign to make a sermon illustration this morning, uh, but it just kind of took its natural course and it declined, it decayed, it slowly, gradually rotted away until the breaking point came. That happens in lives all the time. 
Everything looks great on the outside. We're still perfectly wrapped, but inside we're rotted away and decayed. Until finally someone's just, they're here one Sunday and they're gone the next. What happened to that person, Pastor? Well, it's really not an easy question to answer. Because what happened wasn't just one event or one thing. It was something that happened over a course of time. And, and, t and, and it, indicatively, it is something personal in their own walk with the Lord. But what about if somebody said or did? Well, we can endure anything that anybody says or does if our walk with God is right. Uh, when it's not, that's when we collapse. So he says, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Decline, again, meaning to sink or to uh, diminish or to lean away from. In other words, declining is leaning away from. And I think that you'll see that practically throughout the message this morning, that when I put myself into relationships and environments and positions where I am being drawn to lean away from God, it's only a matter of time before I step away from God. Verse number six, forsake her not wisdom, and she, wisdom, shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. And so she, wisdom, will preserve and keep thee. To preserve means to keep safe from injury or destruction. And, and listen, I understand in the Christian life, uh, we may go through some difficulties and we may have some physical ailments and disease that we have to cope with. Someone may attack us and cause us harm. What he's talking about here is not so much the preservation of the body as the preservation of the soul and the spirit. It keeps or saves from injury or destruction. To save from decay or to defend from corruption. Keep, to preserve or to retain. I was out walking in my neighborhood this week and just a couple days ago and uh, I was walking by a, a, one of the ends of one of the cul-de-sacs in the neighborhood and uh, I got a, just as I was turning down that road, I looked and there was a guy backing his truck in with a new grill. It was beautiful, it was big, it was heavy. Uh, it was half gas on one side and, and uh, charcoal on the other and then it had a smoker box on the side of it and he's out there, probably a younger guy in his, in his you know, early 30s and, uh, and he's out there with his wife and three little children and, uh, and he's, I can see his mind working trying to figure out how am I gonna get this down without hurting them or her or me. Uh, and so I got about a driveway away and I said, you know, would you like a hand with that? And he was astounded that somebody just passing by would offer help. And uh, so I stopped and we just got it to the end of the tailgate and lifted it down real quick. And then he started just conversing about, yeah, I just got this one. My last one only lasts a year. Uh, and I said, well, this is a nice one. Maybe this will last longer. It will do you better. Uh, and he said, how, is, how, how much time do you get out of yours? And I said, well, mine's just simple charcoal and it's just got a little tray that pulls out. And I just got rid of it last winter uh, because the grates were starting to erode and the, the, the ashtray basically just rusted through. It still looked pretty good on the outside, but inside it was all, uh, it, it had gotten just untenable. And, and I said, I got about three years out of it. He said, man, I just get a year out of mine. And what happened? It just decayed. It's just the elements, just, just the nature of its use and the elements that it's exposed to caused it to decay. And I could have maintained it better. I, I could have like brushed the rust off and put some rust-oleum back on there and, uh, and, and helped it, it compensate for the heat of uh, being used, but, uh, but I didn't. And so it declined, it wore away, it decayed. Listen, the world will cause you to decay if you don't maintain your relationship with God. It's just a natural process of life. Wisdom, again, is the proper use of knowledge. And he says here in verse 7, it is the principal thing. Principle meaning chief or most important or most considerable. The chief most important thing in the day-to-day -day Christian life is wisdom. To gain knowledge and to use it properly. And as we look this morning at this text, what I really want to emphasize to you is this. This is not a message to solve an immediate problem. This message is not to treat a symptom. This message is to solve a problem and bring healing. This isn't a, 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 an aspirin to dull pain. This is a surgery to remove cancer. 
this brings spiritual health. And so when I get into this this morning, I think you'll see that this is really the underlying fabric and philosophy of the life that we choose to live. So when we consider that if wisdom is a principal thing, then we must understand what the types of wisdom are, what, what wisdom is out there. There are only two types of wisdom when you boil everything down. And I know that we could get into a long laundry list of all different types of things. But I'm just going to say this morning, when you, when you take away all of the clutter, there are two. There's man's wisdom and there's God's wisdom. Now you can, you can change it, you can morph it, you can, uh, you can make it look slightly different, you can emphasize one part of it over another part at different levels, uh, but when you get down to it, there's only two types of wisdom, man's and God. That's really when you get down to it, the, the, there's only uh, one thing that's true in the spiritual life. There's religion or there's a relationship with God. And when you get into religion, all religion is the same. It doesn't matter whether it's a Baptist religion or a Catholic religion or the Muslim religion or the Buddhist religion or the Hindu religion. Religion is religion. Religion is uh, elevate man and work your way to heaven. And God is have a relationship with me and I'll save your soul. And so, you know, I'm not discounting the importance of church and what God has established. I'm just saying that religion is not the answer. The Lord Jesus Christ is the answer. Amen. And so when you boil it down to that context, then there are two types of wisdom. The first is man's wisdom. And by the way, we're going to spend probably the majority of our time this morning on this introduction and first point. And then the second and third point we'll give you quickly. But we have to lay this foundation in order for us to understand. And I'll probably say some things here in dealing with and pointing out man's wisdom that are going to rub some of us the wrong way because it's so accepted by Christian families and in the Christian mind today uh, that, that we, we resist or resent being called to our attention the truths of God's word in this respect. I, I, there are a lot of things that you could look back that Christians have just accepted over the years that at one point were not accepted. And, uh, and it just, when it, once it was accepted by mainstream Christianity, it was battle over. And I'm telling you that if this battle is over, then Christianity is finished. And so when we look and we understand man's wisdom, what is man's wisdom? Man's wisdom can be summed up in one concept, one word, humanism. When you take and consider what humanism stands for and what humanism is and how humanism is immersed into every element and layer of our culture and society, then you can see the groundwork and the fundamental, uh, the, the fundamental destructive power that humanism has to the thinking and to the, uh, to the movement of Christianity in our hearts. It stems from a statement, the concept of humanism stems from, it really it began in the Garden of Eden uh, with the serpent, but it stems in its modern form uh, from a statement from a 5th century Greek philosopher, uh, Protagoras. Protagoras stated this, man is the measure of all things. When man became the measure of all things, rather than God being the measure of all things, humanism was born. You understand the Greek world, the Greeks worshiped the human mind and the human body. It is the Greek world that gave us the Olympic Games. It is the Greek, and by the way, I'm a fan of watching Olympic events. I'm not bashing the Olympics this morning, but I have to be honest in looking back and evaluating uh, the driving force and philosophy uh, behind where we are today. And the reality is, is that the worship of the human body gave us philosophy. The worship of man gave us uh, all of these different elements of things that we would say are, are, uh, are modern in culture and, uh, and are civilized. And I'm not advocating that we go back to living in a grass hut and carrying around a club to, and a spear to kill our, our food either. I'm just saying this morning that the, that the elevation of man to being the measure of all things is anti-wisdom of God. It is contrary to the culture that God would have us have in our Christian lives. The second statement is that comes from humanism is this, that the solution of all of man's problems is education. Now I am 
for education. Education opens doors. Education provides training. Education prepares. Uh, but I'm saying this morning that with humanism mingled in, the humanistic mindset says that education is the solution to every problem. Education is no more the solution to every problem than government is the solution to every problem. God is the solution to every problem. The word of God is the solution to every problem. The third thing that humanism says is that the key to successful living is getting more. And you'd really have to be intentionally blind to honestly look at our world, especially life in the United States today, and not clearly see these things manifested in front of us. The acquisition of more. Listen, if, if getting more is the answer, then why do so many celebrities that have more money than they know what to do with take their own lives? They're searching for something. There is an emptiness and a void. The solution to successful living is not getting more. It's not a bigger house, a nicer car, uh, or a bigger, uh, a bigger bank account. It is not getting what I want. But the philosophy that's preached in getting more is that you just get to do what you want, when you want, how you want. You are what's important. Your happiness is what's important. And if you get more things, you'll be more happy. That's the message. The Humanist Manifesto was published in 1933. It was written by a man named John Dewey. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he's the one that came up with the Dewey Decimal System that's used in probably every library in the world. He was an American educator, and he was also a board member of the American Humanist Society. In 1973, the Humanist Manifesto II was published. And in those manuscripts, they assert not only the three things that I brought out already, but no deity will save us. And I quote, we must save ourselves. Listen, if I could save myself, I wouldn't need to be here this morning. If I could save myself, then Jesus needed not come to earth, die on the cross and resurrect from the grave. And we have to understand the, the, the world around us is under the control and the authority of the God of this world who is, the, who is the adversary of God in heaven. And so he has put in place a system that naturally leads us in our nature that leans away from God anyway to stay away from God. During the Renaissance or the reawakening, during that period in history, science and art and renewal uh, sprang to be and became emphasized. And during that time, many began to turn away from the Lord. And the books, they say, would turn away from religion. I want you to understand that religion, when I, if, religion in this context means a true, genuine walk of faith in Christ Jesus, not organized religion. And so when we look here, during the Renaissance, many people began to turn away from God. World Book Encyclopedia says of this period, quote, they made man rather than God the center of interest, unquote. When God is no longer the center theme of life and our existence, we're in trouble. Yeah. The world's philosophy, the world's society, the world's culture wants to turn us away from God, not draw us to it. According to, uh, or excuse me, d during enlightenment, John Dewey stated, there is no God and there is no soul. If there is no soul, then there is no existence beyond this life on earth. The Bible says, and God created man and man a man breathed in, God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. We are not here today and gone tomorrow. We were conceived, created by God, and we will exist for eternity in either the lake of fire or in heaven in the presence of God. According to the Humanist magazine, Darwin's discovery of the principle of evolution sounded the death knell of religious and moral values. It removed the ground from under the feet of traditional religion. And when you stop and you consider the wisdom of man, the wisdom of man is about the survival of the fittest. 
that is about changing into whatever you want to become. Do you not see that same principle in the whole LGBTQ plus whatever XYZ plus? And I don't mean to make light. I'm just saying the liberal mind never has any idea where it's going. That's why they had to stick plus on the end of it. So they, they need an open door when they think of something new. And I'm not advocating that anybody be condescended upon or looked down upon or mistreated or be treated unkindly or be treated unfairly. But I am saying that there is a danger to acceptance, to calling sin righteousness and righteousness sin. Yeah. And we live in a time where the world and where the culture and where the news media and where our educators and where our sports enthusiasts, where everything around us preaches to us constantly that right is wrong and wrong is right. Amen. And as a Christian, I want my light to shine. But if I am darkened by the acceptance of the world's philosophy, then my light is dimmed. And we look and we consider that, and I'm not, listen, I'm not telling you things that I just randomly heard. You can look, look go to the humanist website. Just the pictures that they put on there will frighten you. Get a copy of the humanist magazine. They're not secretive about their goal, stated goals of destroying the nuclear family and using every tool at their disposal to accomplish it. It's interwoven into every fabric of our culture. Television programs, day schools, education. At a collegiate level, it's at a whole new level. And again, I'm not against education. I'm saying that as a Christian going into that environment, I better know what I'm walking into. And when I start embracing it and trying to blend it with Christianity, then I'm in trouble. When I'm aware, I can let my light shine. Amen. When I'm aware, I can lift up Christ. And stop and look and evaluate our culture honestly over the last 30 years. Really over the last 100 years. But you see it so much more rapidly accelerating in the last 30. And tell me that these principles have not eroded religious and moral values in our culture. When I was a young little private in the Marine Corps and I got to my first duty station after all of my schools, it was at Marine Barracks in Washington, D.C. on 8th and I Streets. When I got there, there was a colonel. It was a regimental sized unit, so colonels generally are commanding officers of regiments. There was a young colonel there named Peter Pace. Peter Pace is significant in Marine Corps history because Peter Pace would later become, as a four-star general, the first Marine general to serve as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Either during the late Clinton years or the early Bush 41 years, as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colonel Pace granted an interview to a news organization. At the time, there was a big push to normalize uh, gay and lesbi lesbian service members, being, people being permitted to serve in the armed forces. General Pace was asked this question. General, is the Marine Corps for or against normalizing that lifestyle into the common ranks? General Pace's answer was this. The Marine Corps is against normalizing all forms of immorality in its ranks. Now, I'm not saying that the Marine Corps is filled with moral men, or women for that matter. But I am saying at least its values are moral. To state what's right and what's wrong. He was fired. And that didn't happen last week. You would expect that today. I mean, that's really how fast this has advanced. We would expect someone to take that position to, to, to lose every position publicly that they would hold and to be canceled by the culture. But at the time, it should have been an answer that was well received. It wasn't derogatory. It wasn't putting down one sin over another. It was just simply stating the fact that men and women who serve, who are not morally corrupt, make better 
service members. He cared about in preserving the integrity of the core. And he lost his job because of it. What I'm saying this morning is that the humanistic philosophy of this world exists to draw people away from God and it has lived to fulfill its prophecy by Charles Darwin that it is the death knell of religious and moral values and it has removed the ground from under the feet of traditional religion or religious values. This is the wisdom of man. The wisdom of man says everybody live together in harmony and accept everything and don't condemn anything. And listen, I think it's wrong for Christians to be antagonistic or judgmental or condemning of people of any, with any sin in their life. But don't ask me to put a stamp of approval on it and say that it's not sin. And when we begin, and listen, the, these words have been spoken by young people in this church within the last two to six months. Around the election. That it's a wonderful thing that the gay and lesbian agenda and rights and all of that type of thing are being expanded now. That is the thinking, not of a lost person, but of a Christian person who has blended the doctrine and the philosophy and the culture of this world, humanistic philosophy with Christian philosophy. These things ought not so to be. That it, there is a problem when we think that normalizing sin is okay with God. And as God's people, when we do that, we diminish our light. We're walking through the darkest of nights in this world. And we're doing so with a matchstick. Or as a matchstick rather than a beam. We cannot embrace the philosophy of this world and stand out as a light against it. Again, I think everyone should be treated with dignity and respect. But I think that sin should be called sin. Amen. And I think that my life should be a light in the darkness and agreeing with sin is not giving God an opportunity to work in the hearts of men to condemn their sins so that they'll see their need and come to Christ to salvation, for salvation. The wisdom of man has been accepted by society. It's been taught in our schools from the earliest of ages. It's been preached as the gospel at colleges and universities. It's been woven into every children's program. And, and listen, I realize there's some decent children's programming. I have grandchildren. I have things that we thoroughly vet to watch with them. Uh, but listen, uh, when, when something as seemingly innocent as Arthur is having gay weddings to promote to five-year-olds, there's a problem. And God help us to be parents that are open, that have our eyes open to what our kids are being indoctrinated with rather than just going with the flow and accepting what the world is putting out there. That is the wisdom of man. Contrast that with the wisdom of God. God is the power. Three, three thoughts about this this morning and we're going to look at a couple of texts and then we'll move on to point number two this morning. God's wisdom. Number one, God is the proper and central focus of life. God has no real meaning, or man, life has no real meaning apart from him. As a child of God, I should understand that apart from my Savior, my life has little value and no meaning. Colossians explains it as Paul wrote to the church at Colossae uh, in chapter number 1 in verses 16 through 18. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Listen, God's philosophy is put me first 
and I'll protect you and I'll grow you and I'll bless you and I'll use you and your life will have meaning. The world's man's philosophy is about is promote yourself. Do whatever feels good to you. Draw yourself and immerse yourself in whatever you want to do and everyone should be okay with that. That's the philosophy of man. But God's philosophy is lift me up. Did Jesus not say that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men into me? Amen. I cannot be used by God to draw men to Christ if I am bringing him down to accept man's sin as normal rather than lifting him up. Secondly, this morning, in God's wisdom, I would say this, that the solutions of all of man's problems are found somewhere between Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and Revelation chapter 22 and verse 21. The answers to the problems of this world are not found in the philosophies of it. We are not of this world. When Jesus Christ saved us, we became citizens of heaven. We sing the song, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. We are not intended to be here forever. We are only intended to be here for a short while and to imprint Christ on the world around us while we're here. Psalm 19 and verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy, in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What I'm saying this morning is that the solution of all of man's problems are found in the word of God. They're found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not found in the thinking and the philosophy and in the ways of this world. But they run diametrically opposed to them. When you look at what the world is embracing and you want to know what would Jesus do, what does he think about it? Think the opposite. Because he is the antithesis of everything that this world values. Third, I would say that the key to successful living is focusing upon God in every area of life and submitting to his word, not my, my own will. In Joshua chapter number one, in verse number eight, well-known text, well-known passage, uh, the Bible says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all, that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You want to be successful? Live the word of God. Number two this morning. First we see the, the types of wisdom. Secondly, we see the tests of wisdom. All of us, I hope, would say, I want to live by God's wisdom. But the reality of how, well, how much we are immersed into our culture today and how much we blended is revealed by the choices that we make. Now, I, I want, I, I'm the type of person that honestly assesses things. And for good or bad, whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable, if you don't honestly assess it, then you don't know what you're walking into. I'm grateful for men like Brother Don, who stands and teaches in a secular school and tries to be a light in a dark world. I, there was a man that has been in public education at the college level, has retired for decades in the first service. He came to me after he said, every single thing that you said was well presented and was absolutely correct. I've never met a Christian educator that would argue with the points that I'm making today because they've lived in the middle of it. And I'm grateful that there are some Christians in public education because we need that light in the darkness. Amen. 
But the reality is, is that when I test my wisdom, whose wisdom do I live by? It's revealed by choices that I make in life. And I could go on a list of choices that cover everything from A to Z. But three primary things that really affect our lives. Education choices. The Bible says in Psalm 1 that we are to abstain from the, to, to, the, the views of this world is walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. We are not to walk, stand, or sit with those that are anti-God. And if we do, we bring to ourselves destruction. That's the message of Psalm 1. Choices that test our wisdom are our education choices. Who are going to influence us? And I'm not talking about, uh, in this case, just school. We should be being educated for a lifetime. We should be learning until we go to the grave. Priority choices. What am I putting first? Who's first in my life? Is it God or is it me? Is it God's will or is it my desires? Am I trying to make God happy? Am I trying to please him or am I trying to please people around me? Priority choices. It's lifestyle choices. But pastor, I'm, I've, I've got to, I, I've got to go to work. I understand you've got to go to work. You should be a light there. I have to go to school. I understand you have to go to school. Be a light there. I have to go buy groceries. Be a light my point this morning is not to condemn individual institutions. This message is far larger than that. My message this morning is the world's philosophy. And if I don't understand its danger, then I get sucked into it, incorporated into my everyday life, and I Christianize it by accepting it and normalizing it into the Christian way of thinking, and it becomes to draw me away or cause me to lean away from God. What does God say? The second, because really my opinion doesn't matter. It's what saith the Lord. Lifestyle choices. Second Corinthians chapter six uh, and verse number uh, verse number fourteen, and really uh, uh, verse eleven and on, or fourteen and on, being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, doesn't mean not interact. It don't, don't yoke up with them. Don't embrace their ideas. Don't embrace their sin. Don't call evil good and good. Evil, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The choices of our wisdom. And listen, this is just on a practical level. This is what this is. When I came, when I became the pastor here almost nine years ago, we had a, a, a pretty large group of young people that all uh, rode the bus. None of their families came. And what became overwhelmingly obvious and apparent, and I don't know what the culture is within, and it was one specific, most of them were from one specific high school in our city. And it isn't about that particular school, I'm just trying to demonstrate the influence of the culture. It was very apparent to those that were working with them, and it, this manifested itself to be true within their families moving forward over the next four and five years. That if you were at this school and you wanted to be cool, popular, or whatever, then you picked up the label of being gay, lesbian, or bisexual. If you wanted to be accepted, if you wanted to be thought of as cool, and the message really this morning is not even about the gay and lesbian agenda, it's bigger than that. People think that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. That's just one small part of it. That, that is the tip of the iceberg. That is not, the, 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 honestly, that's part of the judgment before the destruction. When you get down to the theological aspects of it. And what I'm talking about this morning is this. 
is that when I get to the place where I can sit down and say that I'm spending all of my leisure time and all of my friendships are wrapped up in people that have different doctrinal beliefs, that have different values, that accept different sinful lifestyles, uh, that have whether, that, no matter how they manifest themselves, when that is my norm and that is the center of my universe and, the, and my relationships are intertwined with them, then I am set on a course of destruction. You cannot honestly evaluate scriptural principle and that argument and, and reject it if you want to please God. I, there's just no logical way to accomplish that. So, Pastor, you really don't want a big church, do you? That's God's business. I just want to speak truth. I, I want the truth to be known. Listen, lifestyle choice shows what we have accepted in mainline Christianity today. And it's evident in our pulpits, it's evident in our, even in our church schools, it's evident in our, uh, in our ministries, in our outreach, it's evident in our Bible colleges, it's evident in every area of Christian life that we are willing at this point to in an effort to appease and not to offend blend the doctrine, the philosophy, and the values of this world with Christian values and to normalize them. And I would not be in my duty as a pa doing my duty as a pastor to not cry out against the blending of God's way with the world's way. Conflict then tests our wisdom. So pastor, then how do I be a light? You be kind. You look for opportunities to share truth. You, you be compassionate and build relationships with people to share the gospel. But when that relationship turns away from an opportunity to share the gospel, if they're living in a wicked, sinful, unchristian lifestyle, or if they have stark, dramatic, doctrinal disagreements with you philosophically, uh, then you don't spend a lot of time fellowshipping with them. Listen, I, there, are, there are people that visit our church on occasion uh, that we have some doctrinal disagreements. And I love them and they love me and they even sometimes call me for advice or for counsel and they, uh, they, they reach out on a regular basis and, uh, and, and we communicate. But they don't go to church here because there's some doctrinal disagreements. And I don't go sit and have coffee with them. If they need help, I'll help them. If they need advice, I'll give it. But I'm not inviting them over to my house and I'm not sitting down at, uh, at Cracker Barrel and, and, and spend a lot of time with them outside of an opportunity to influence them to the truth. Why? Because I don't want to be drawn away. Yeah. And when you put yourself in an environment where you be friendly to everyone but don't be friends with everyone. And we look and we consider the truth that we have to understand that conflict then tests the wisdom. The world system is easier. And that's just a reality. It's easy to buy into the world's way. Why? Because everyone's going that way. Yeah. It's easy to go downstream. It's hard to go against the current. It, it, it's easy to blend in. No one wants to stand out. But our duty as God's children is to stand out. And I'm not talking about looking like some freak show. I'm talking about our values and our demeanor and our compassion and our love and our, uh, and our, our righteous, godly, firm stand on the truth should be in stark contrast to the world around us. Conflict will test that. How will it test it? Well, practically, it's going to test it by people that want to be your friends that don't want your Jesus. It's going to test you by, uh, by making you choose whether or not you're going to put God first at work or work first. It's going to test you in every aspect of life. And then lastly this morning we see the triumph of wisdom. God's wisdom ultimately preserves the faith. God's wisdom is the preservation of faith. You, you know... You stop and you think about this on a practical level. Why did God in the Old Testament, it was the, the position so strong when they went into the Canaan land and when they went to other places in, in blending cultures? Look at Solomon's own life, the writer of this text. 
He was the wisest man that ever lived and he died away from God in sin because he took on wives that believed in other gods and they drew his heart from God's. You see that manifested in the light of life of Lot in 2 Peter chapter number 2. And we're almost done this morning. 2 Peter chapter 2 uh, and verse number 4. For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, but delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample to those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation or lifestyle of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And his leaf shall not wither. But the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. The reality this morning is this, is that I can live my life as Lot, vexing myself with the lifestyle of this world, I can live as Lot, having my righteous soul vexed from day to day with their unlawful or ungodly unrighteous deeds, or I can turn to God and stand true and live for Him. And when I do, my faith is preserved. It's the preservation of our faith. God wants our way of life, His truths preserved. It's the preservation, secondly, of the family. If you don't have to dig very deep and you don't have to look too deep into a website of the humanist, the humanist website to find out that their stated goal is the destruction of the nuclear family. And they'll use every avenue possible at every level possible to accomplish it. Why? Because the family is what God ordained. The family is what shows us a proper family is what shows us a proper relationship with God. It is the preserva preservation of our future. I, I, I'm a, as fast as the world has changed and our country's changed in the last 30 years since I was in my 20s. I'm afraid what it's going to look like 30 years after I'm gone. Yeah. It'll collapse. Every democracy has at about the age that we are. Yeah. We're on that course. All you have to do, and you look and you study history, every great democracy in history has collapsed when the people realized that they could vote themselves gifts from the treasury. Most of us got a gift from the treasury this last week. But the gift wasn't really a gift. It was an advancement of an agenda that's anti-God. When we look and we understand the truth of God's word, wisdom, the wisdom of God will help you triumph in this life. It will preserve you. It will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. And without it, every area of life will decline from God. And my goal this morning is not to upset anyone or make anyone angry. My goal this morning is simply to lay out the truth. God has his way and Satan has his. They are opposite. Yeah. And when the church tries to blend the two, we're in trouble.